Nelson? Well, this is a good example. It's not a question of smaller government or bigger government. It's a size, it's a question of what's the right size for government. And part of the problem with these type of things is the way the legislature does fiscal notes. If you spend more on advertising, it just simply counts as you're spending more. There's no balance on the other side of the ledger. We haven't gotten into, shall we say, more complicated fiscal notes. But we can't afford to take your industry and make it weaker at this time. We really need to have you to have record years in tourism. We really need out in western North Dakota to get those tourists that have been avoiding that to come back. And to do that, we're only going to do that through advertising. And it doesn't work efficiently for you as individuals to do a lot of that advertising outside your area to try and get somebody to come from another state or another province or something. We really have to do that as a state. And there's so many examples of this very sort of thing throughout government. We can't afford to cut this. This has to be a priority. I don't really care what the fiscal notes say. We have to spend the money. Thank you. Most of the difference between, uh, shall we say, permanent funding, as Charlie calls it, and one-time funding is just a mental barrier. If you're in your home and you try to run a budget and you say, we're only going to have a budget, we're going to cut back, we're not going to do any one-time spending. We're just going to have those things. So you say, well, that's rent, that's food, that's utilities, those things. But we're not going to, for the next two years, we're not going to buy a TV set, we're not going to buy a car, we're not going to fix a car, we're not going to buy tires for the car. Well, you rapidly run into, there's always one-time spending. And it's really only a mental difference to people. And, and partly it's become a target now, because the idea of some people was they just looked at how much the shortfall in the general fund was. And that's almost the same as the things that are labeled as one-time spending. So, oh, we just eliminate one-time spending and we can balance the budget. The state cannot run without one-time spending. You know, you can't run your home that way, you can't run any business that way, it, it's just there. So I'm not worried a whole lot about where the uh, funding comes from or how it's, it's labeled. Uh, there's necessary spending and some unnecessary spending in both the one-time and the permanent funding. But again, we just can't afford to cut back on advertising at a time like this. I mean, it doesn't make sense in any time but why would we do that to ourselves? So yes, I will fight for it. Uh, you know, and, and it's one of those frustrating things. I don't know when I show up if it will be in the budget because I do not get to create the budget. Jack Derrimple gets to create the budget. He'll be giving in just the next, next couple of weeks, he'll be giving guidelines to his agencies. They'll have, t uh, they'll have the budget in in July. They'll have a permanent budget in in October. They'll hand it out in December. And then I'm going to show up to town and we'll have to work with what there is. But, but advertising and tourism, I don't care where we call it, what we call it, it's, it's a critical thing right now for our state. Okay. This is gonna be a difficult area because I'd say probably half the legislature or half the people running for the legislature have already signed no tax pledges. Some of the people running for governor have already signed no tax pledges, no more income. There's going to be cats and dogs fighting for everything. Already there's people talking about one-time spending, and so now here you got a grant for somebody's business that's one-time spending. Where is the legislature going to cut? You, if you want this, you're going to have to be there, and you're going to have to have things that you want that money for, it's not going to just be, oh, let's just appropriate this money, and it's going to be there, because it's going to be very tough. And I, I, I honestly, looking at the makeup and stuff, I don't think you're going to hold that 750. I think it's going to get cut. I'd say probably cut to a half, maybe cut to a third, because they're going to say, well, we don't have to spend that money today. We don't have those things. You're, that's a target. If you want to protect that, if you want to get that funding, Realize that you have an uphill battle because there's not going to be money even to run a lot of the other things. You know, how far is this, the legislature going to cut higher ed? How far is the legislature going to cut the schools? How far is the legislature going to cut the roads? I mean, that's what you're up against. 
The advertising is a cleaner, straighter forward thing where you can show very clearly. But you got a hard t case to make to show that those funds, based on those large things, are going to provide an immediate rate of return for a state that's in extreme trouble as far as budget. You hear a lot that it's $1.1 billion. Well, that's the general fund. If you move over on the non-general fund, the SIF fund, we spent almost $2 billion out of it this year, and the projection is for it to have $30 million this next biennium. And the way it's going right now, it's not going to have $30 million. So it's a $3 billion swing in what the state's spending. Everybody and his dog is going to be there fighting for what's left over, and you're going to have a hard time holding that. And there's very limited what I can do. I can't threaten a veto. I can lobby. I can lobby just like you can. In some ways, you might have more power on that than I do. But you'll have to talk to the, to the people in the legislature, and you'll have to get them away from those stupid pledges. Because they're basically pledging that they're not going to do their job. They're not going to make the hard decision. They're going to sign a little politically expedient thing, and then they're going to use that to run on. And so you're probably on the chopping block. We just had thousands and thousands and thousands of working people in western North Dakota who were here for more than a weekend and who as soon as their oil job quit, packed up and left the state. Now we're going to spend money trying to get them back. Something's wrong. They're not going to work in the oil industry. They're not going to get jobs like they had before. Many of them had college degrees. Many of them had families back home. They packed up as soon as their job there quit, and they left the state. Almost every day during this campaign, I run into young people, young professionals, who say, I am leaving North Dakota because it is not a welcoming place to me. It does not surprise me that Fargo, which really has made an effort to be that welcoming place, is doing quite well financially right now because they're reaping the benefits of 20, 30 years of reaching out and being welcoming to people. But most of our state has not been similarly welcoming. As a matter of fact, in the legislature, we're significantly unwelcoming to a lot of people. And you're going to see more legislation to make people feel unwelcome. We have 14,000 unfilled jobs, and we're still kicking people out of this state every day because we don't like them. And they don't like us anymore after that either. They, a lot of them, are what we we call the creative people, the people who make this an interesting place to live, the people who, who are involved in arts, who are involved in, in those sorts of things, and those are the people who really make your communities places worth visiting. And we are still today kicking those people out of this state. It was one of the, the things that really gave me mixed feelings about calling for a special session. I really think it would have been very difficult to come back out of Bismarck after a special session without about a 10% cut in higher ed. And they are clearly on the chopping block for next session because they're the only place with enough budget to potentially make up many of the other shortfalls when we don't bring in any additional revenue. And uh, it's a uh, it's, it's literally been open warfare uh, between many members of the legislature and the higher ed for quite a while. And, and I don't really understand it, but uh, we're even coming in now where next session will be the first session of the, uh, that we've ever done where the budgeting process for higher ed is going to be exactly the same as it is for everything else. So all those other income sources that they have and stuff are going to come right into the legislature and be seen. So there's, there's a whole bunch of members who really want to get control of, of that money. And the legislature is frustrated in that we've increased spending and increased spending, and yet the constant cry is how short we are. You know, you look, there was quite an increase to UND, and even before the budget shortfall, they had to come up with a 5% cut. Because, uh, you know, even with that increase in spending, what was there wasn't enough for what they, they wanted to spend. Clearly, higher ed is, is an important function, and clearly it's a driver of our economy. Uh, everybody talks tuition. You know, when I went to college, tuition was probably the least 
uh, expense. It's time. And we're frustrated because four-year degrees turn into five-year degrees, turn into six-year degrees, turn into never degrees. And five and six years, I know my son went to Concordia and one of the big sales uh, pitches was, you'll be out of here in four years. You won't waste another year of your life to get the degree that you would have anyway. And I really shouldn't say waste at Concordia, he loved the place. But uh, Thank you. <laughs> he, uh, he played football there and uh, it seems strange this fall not to have to go to Minneapolis every other weekend for a game in the Mayak. But uh, uh, you know, that is really where the costs come in and it's very frustrating because what is happening? Why can't students get the classes that they need to graduate on time on their schedule. And in many ways it's frustrating because it seems the model is right in the middle of campuses. If you look at the NDSU Bison football team, nobody comes from out of state to play football and then we just see if he's football material and if he's student material and if he doesn't make it, he doesn't make it. Somebody checks his grades every week. He's told he needs to show up to study. There's always somebody supervising how every step of the way is going. Yet most of the other students, when I talk to them, their academic advising consists of five minutes with their advisor to sign off on a schedule that they already worked and they're out of there. Nobody seems to really care. They actually almost feel like they're an imposition on the day of the administration at NDSU or UND. And then our colleges are amazed long term that they have trouble raising endowment when they treat their students that way. So we are not doing well with what we have. Our students, part of why we're flying to Malaysia to get math students is we're not instilling in our students that they should dream dreams. What they're hearing is math is tough and you'll never get it. But over in Malaysia they have a culture that the way you succeed is a math degree is an engineering degree, is a chemistry degree. You know, my sister graduated from NDSU, a world-class institution in chemistry. I was proud of that. And I've been embarrassed that one of their two buildings doesn't have running water and hasn't had running water for years. The students from China seem to adapt to that pretty well, but the students from Colorado don't. And so we seem to have really lost our way in higher ed with how they treat our students. There's a reason that many in the legislature are not happy with higher ed. They can get the money, but they need to look at the students, they need to supervise the students, they need to take care of the students. We could do a lot more with what we've got. And it makes me sad that it's almost certain that higher ed is going to get cut substantially because our state is going to suffer for that for years. But that's where it's come now and that's where we're at. So I would like to see it can go, but we, we have this problem with this arm length relationship between the legislature and higher ed. The only thing we get to control is the money. We don't get to control the management. And the management has honestly not been good. It's good to some people, it treats some well. I went to Botno and I went to Fargo. And let me tell you, if I ever give any money to an institution, I'm giving it to Botno. Because when I was there, I was treated as an important human being. And when I went to Fargo, I was treated like I was a pain in the ass. And I probably was. <laughs> I see a lot of students drop out because they get mentally tired they have a problem back at home. They have some problem. I was reading about one college and they did something that cost them nothing. They took those students after a semester who are on academic probation. You know the ones, 0, 0.00 grade point average, not gonna make it. Not college material is what we determine in North Dakota. But this college didn't believe in that. And they brought in a whole bunch of successful businessmen who'd been in exactly that same situation. And they said, I'm right where you are. Don't give up. Start to work at it. You can be like me. And by simply having a couple hour seminar and re-imaging in the students' minds, 
they cut their dropout rate on those students by well over half. Nobody is putting the proper images in our students' minds. And as governor, that would be one of the primary things that I would want to do. I want to get out to the grade schools, I want to get out to the colleges, and I want our students to dream dreams. Special places. Lake Sakakawea has about nine oil pipelines that have gone under it, some of them for over 50 years, many of which have had no supervision, often no, not even any sovereign land permits. There's more new pipelines going under Lake Sakakawea. Half the state's drinking out of Lake Sakakawea and the other half wants to. It doesn't really matter if you call it a special place or not, it's a special place. We have to be very careful not to destroy that special place, both because it's our drinking water and it's our tourist industry. I was very disappointed with the Sandpiper Pipeline route. I paid attention to that largely because it runs right through my home quarter. It'll be about 900 feet from my mom's bedroom, but I did not complain about that. I complain because when they come through south of Kandu, they head right for Devil's Lake and they bounce along the shore of there. And as an ag consultant, I've had periods of time when I haven't been able to get to that shore for three weeks with a four-wheeler. And if we have a spill in that area, there's no chance for us to intercept it before it's in the lake. And it's going to hit the whole national news that there's oil in Devil's Lake and the tourists are going to quit coming. It needed to be, the route needed to be bent to the north to give us a chance to protect that lake. And that lake should be protected. It's critical for us in that area. But they didn't do that. The Public Service Commission didn't do that. We get into the special places thing, and there I have a little problem with Wayne, because we have an Administrative Agencies Practices Act. And it says if you're going to do something as an administrative agency that has the effect of law, you have to go through the rulemaking process. And the Industrial Commission did not go through the rulemaking process. They pretended to go through the rulemaking process, and in the end, they have a policy. And the only thing a policy can legally do is control the employees of the Industrial Commission. If push comes to shove and he's in a court case, you cannot enforce a policy by law on anyone else. So if you're going to go through it, why didn't you, you do it? Now today, there's a hearing in Dickinson. And the first change in the Industrial Commission rules for the oil and gas is that anyone who doesn't own property or manage property in the immediate vicinity of what a hearing is being held on won't have legal standing to testify. Many of you, your business relies on things that are in your area that you don't own. But these hearings have an effect on you, and you should be able to testify. If you don't like this, you have until the 25th to, to file a written comment about that. And if you'll notice, Wayne is here. The commissioners are not attending the four hearings across the state. Their employees are. So he's basically going to be given a little summation of, of what is going on. Some, many of the things that they also have in there are very good. Things like a berm around the sites. After thousands and thousands of spills that have escaped the sites, we're finally going to put a berm around the site. I can't understand why that wasn't done 40 years ago. So there's a lot of special places in North Dakota. It's all kind of special to me. But we're still not doing a good job. When I go through Botnell County, which is just to the west of me, there are literally thousands of acres of desolated land from the oil development. All I have to do is walk across the line into Manitoba and those desolate acres disappear. You can see it on Google Earth. We, as a state, force those landowners to allow those oil companies to destroy their land. Now, as a landowner, People say, well, you can sue. Good luck with that. For much of the time, we had a two-year statute of limitations. Now we've gone to six. 
But if you sue, you better have 300 grand at least in your pocket. And you're going to go through letter after letter after letter. And when you get all done, if you've got 10 acres of destroyed land, the company's going to say, oh, that land is worth $3,000 an acre. Here's your $30,000. Have a nice day. The landowners cannot protect themselves. The only place that can protect them is the state government. And by not protecting them, by allowing spill after spill after spill, now in western North Dakota, you can't get a pipeline in the ground because the only way a landowner will let it go in his ground if he gets so much money that even if it destroys his land, he's still ahead. So it's been bad for business. It's creating all sorts of traffic out there that's unnecessary. It's been totally mismanaged from one end to the other. And that's, there you go, special places. We cannot allow the Bakken to have the same thing happen to it that happened in Botno and Burke counties and Renville counties. We cannot allow that because all of western North Dakota will have a significant area that's wasteland if we do. And they'll tell you how great these, these standards are, but they aren't. It works good when you've got good companies that are new and they're, they're multinationals and the equipment's new, but 30, 40 years from now, when those tanks are still there and those stripper wells start to function, we're going to probably go through the same thing. Because when our oil and gas division inspects, they really don't inspect. If you read inspection reports in many cases, it's check meters, check meters, check meters. I had a site in Botnell County I went to that for eight months there was an unlit flare there that the gas would just about knock me on my, on my feet, off my feet every time I went there. It was a spill site. It was repeatedly visited by both oil and gas division and by state health department people. And that flare was never lit. And you could hear the igniter, which had, had been uh, broken and was laying in the ground, just like you hear an electric fencer. Click, click, click. You could hear that over the whole site. You could smell the gas over the whole site. And nobody did anything. And that's what we have. Well, it's an honor to be here today, and I really appreciate you for being such a good audience and, and listening to us. And I hope that we can all work together and move forward to create a North Dakota that has a future for us and for our children and for those who could come here. Uh, your, yours is such an important industry to make North Dakota a place that we want to live. And I wish you all success.